Welcome to Wild Teesside. My name's Ian Bond and I'm an ecologist with the Industry Nature Conservation Association, which is better known as Inca. Um, this talk is just a brief tour through some of the habitats and species that you'll find on Teesside uh, and an even briefer plug for a book of the same name, which you brought out to celebrate 30 years of industry and nature, or at least 30 years of Inca. So what do we mean by Teesside? Well, this red line boundary is the area that we're covering uh, as Inca and also covering in the book. The book itself is, is similar in, in style to the, the book, The Natural History of Upper Teesdale, but whereas that might be the wildest area in England, Teesside is probably the most developed. Um, pretty much all the area you can see within there and certainly the area between the roads that run from Middlesbrough up to Seaton Carew, then again from Middlesbrough to Redcar, would have been C less than 200 years ago. Uh, that would have all been at the tidal, and that has all largely been filled in in that interim period. Some of it is as recently as the 1970s. So it's a highly modified uh, man-made landscape. And within, within this area, there's probably about 17 square miles of, of industrial land. And this is what people would traditionally think of as Teesside, smoggy land. So great big factories belching out chemicals, though, though I should point out that the chemicals in question are largely H2O. And there will be the odd other compound bits of nitrous oxides and that in there, but everything is very closely controlled and monitored these days compared to what it would have been 50 years ago. Um, but if that's a typical image, this is also Teesside. And if you look at it like this, it's an awful lot greener. Um, so this is Billingham in the foreground and Middlesbrough just on the bend of the river, uh, on, the, on the bend of the river Tees. And as you can see, there's a lot of industry. There's an awful lot of green stuff in there as well. And even just to take this, this small area in right in the foreground there, um, it looks, it is, it looks and is small in the grand scheme of things, but actually you've probably got about four or five football pitches there of land that is just left to get on with it. Uh, and there's a lot of land like that sandwiched between industry or surrounding industry. Um, so Teesside isn't necessarily what you'd expect. And just to take another view here, this is looking from uh, Middlesbrough football ground in the foreground, and you're looking down the river, down to the coast, and as you can see again, lots of industry and lots of fairly wild land as well in between them. And just to kind of, by way of, of illustrating this juxtaposition between the two, this is a map showing in the green hatched, the boundaries of the site of special scientific interest. Um, until a couple of years ago, there were seven fairly small triple SIs on T side. And these were all rationalized and amalgamated and expanded um, to, into the Teesmouth and Cleveland Coast Triple SI. So that now takes in the entire river up to the Tees Barrage. Uh, it takes in all of Saltum, that's just bits of it. And interestingly, it takes in a number of industrial sites, operational industrial sites as well. So a large part of Teesside is actually Triple SI. 
And sitting underneath the SSSI designation, you've got local wildlife sites, which aren't statutory, but they do receive protection under their respective local plans. And uh, these, these red polygons here are all local wildlife sites that are all on industrial land. Uh, and this is a borough of Hartlepool, and it's a, a bit of an interesting history in, on Teesside with regards to local wildlife sites. Because when Cleveland County was split up, the ecologist post went to Hartlepool. So the, the, the sites in Hartlepool, the, the industrial sites in Hartlepool that met the objective criteria of selection, they are all identified and selected. Um, not necessarily the same in the other, in the remaining boroughs on Teesside, but that said, Every borough will have industrial sites which meet criteria for selection as local wildlife sites. So that might be, for example, in, in this case, great crescent newts, dingy skipper butterfly, reed beds, passage migrants, that sort of thing. Just coming back to the triple SI then, the triple SI, as it, as it originally was, um, was mainly uh, designated for the wetland habitats, the intertidal habitats, and this is brown sands on the south of the river and looking back you can see the transporter bridge in the background and this is 50 hectares of of mud flat sand flat and on the north you've got 150 hectares of seal sands which uh, being called seal sands has been famous for its seals for four centuries and 150 hectares might sound a lot but it's tiny to what it was and the, uh, the tanks and the towers you can see in the background, that was all part of the seal sands until the 1970s as well. But still, still an awful lot of habitat out there and an awful lot of wildlife using it. And as well as the, the habitats themselves, the triple SI originally was designated for the birds by specific species of birds, such as these, these little terns which traditionally did breed on Teesside. Then in 1995, they moved up to Crimden um, on, on the durham Hartlepool border. Within the last couple of years, they've moved back down to Teesside and decided to nest on the, uh, the recreational beach at Seaton Carew, right in front of the fairground site, which as you can imagine, causes one or two problems, birds and people. And it's also designated just for the vast number of birds, the wintering water bird assemblage as it's technically known. I'm not going to try and identify these, but there are a lot of wintering water birds with the former steelworks in the background on the other side of the river. With the, with the expansion of the Triple SI, uh, has come an expansion of, of the interest features. So uh, this is the little egret and it moved in as a, as a wintering or a non breeding bird at least, uh, probably 20 years ago and has, has got to quite reasonable numbers, but it's only in the last couple of years that it's actually started breeding here. So it's now could be classed as, as part of the breeding bird assemblage. This one is definitely part of the breeding bird assemblage, young mallard duckling. Another new feature of the triple SI though is, uh, is the invertebrates associated with the sand dunes. Uh, and there's a, an assemblage of them, that probably the only one I can pronounce is, is the grilling butterfly, which is this one here. It's not actually on sand dune in this picture. This is on a bit of brownfield. It's on blast furnace slag. And actually the numbers on, on the sand dunes aren't that high, but the numbers on the, the brownfield, the industrial sites, number in there several hundred. We, we, there will easily be 500 grilling butterfly on the industrial sites. And Another feature that, that Tees Mouth is pretty well known for these days are the seals. Uh, and the seals have also been included as an interest feature for Triple SI. And the reason for that is uh, it's the only breeding colony between East Anglia and, and the Firth of Hawke. It wasn't until recently, I believe there are a few now on Holy Island and off Ravenscar. But, but basically this is the main colony in between. And the only place where seals have recolonized the river um, with the area being known as seal sands, you can imagine traditionally it was, was a good place for seals, but by the middle of the 20th century, they disappeared completely. Uh, and then you started recolonizing at the back end of that century. And the colony has been going from strength to strength. 
And pretty much Inca has been associated with them throughout its history. It's one of the main things we've done is to run an annual monitoring program. Um, we get both types of seal on Teesside, but it's actually the breeding harbour seal. It's a triple SI interest feature, and it's the main, the main feature of, of our monitoring. And the monitoring has been going on since 1989, and we've been leading on it since 1992. And it's a fairly extensive monitoring program. We're out there every day, or at least our volunteers are, every day for three months of the summer. And they're counting the number of seal pups, the number of seals that are hauling out on each tide, whether, it, whether they're getting disturbed, whether there's any injuries, or basically just recording a number of, number of items of data relating to seals. So we've got a 30 year run of data on seal populations on Teesside. And as I say, it's, it's unlike a sort of a once annually spot count, we're counting them every day. And that's quite interesting actually, because the numbers do fluctuate quite a bit from day to day. You're never gonna get all of the seals hauled out at any one time. You're only gonna get a percentage of them. Um, so counting them every day over a long period gives you a much better idea of how many seals you've got rather than just, just a one-off count. And this is a, this is a picture of a, a mother harbour seal with a, with a young pup, which I think she's grooming rather than drowning in that particular picture. And these are the uh, results of, uh, of the monitoring. So as you can see, the, the, the figures increased from initially 1989, about 20 harbour seals and about the same number of greys. Number of harbours then increased very steadily, gradually up to about 2000, then levelled off till about 2010 and then have increased ever since. Um, the 2018 count is a bit of a blip, we think, because we changed the monitoring in that year. Usually we'll have two monitors at two locations counting simultaneously. That year we had a single person who moved between the two and we thought that would probably work as well. And I suspect it didn't. So probably the 2018 blue column wants to be somewhere between the 17 and the 19 columns. Uh, and if you add in the number of grey seals to that, uh, these are peak counts, by the way, uh, add in the number of grey seals and factor in that probably only about 75% of seals are hauled out at, uh, at a maximum, then we will have well over 200 seals in the teeth estuary now, which is pretty good. And the, the birth rate of seal pups mirrors that quite well. So initially, um, the, um, the seal pups uh, weren't surviving, and that may be because of the fairly heavy um, chemical burden that seals were perhaps uh, harboring in the, in the early years, PCBs and PAHs perhaps. We're not entirely sure, but that would probably be a, a reasonable explanation. Um, but the numbers have increased, um, again, gradually, until typically we're getting 20 pups, um, 20, 20 pups born each year. And um, most of those are surviving at least, certainly till weaning. It's, it's obviously the post weaning period is, is, is the, uh, the hardest time for, for any mammal. Um, unfortunately, in 2019, um, a lot of the seal pups were um, struck down by some kind of illness um, and the same happened in 2020, and, and most of the seal pups that were born actually were found dead in, in both those two years. Um, Teesside University are working with the British Divers Marine Life Rescue to try and get to the bottom of that, uh, and hopefully they, they'll kind of have a better idea by the time we get to this year's pupping season, so that they can, they can treat any, any pups that are found more effectively. Uh, but generally speaking, this is, you know, other than whatever this issue turns out to be, we've got a healthy population of, of seals on the Ts. So in terms of habitats, there are two main habitats really that take up the majority of Teesside. But well, one of them is wetlands, and this is uh, an aerial view of RSPB salt home, looking a bit like the uh, the Ocavango there, I would say. 
which needs a few sit of tundra and the odd marsh line in there to complete the picture. Um, fast areas of, uh, of seasonally wet grassland, as well as some permanent, as very large permanent pools, as well as supporting very large numbers of wetland birds. And this is Dabwam Gut, and just out of picture on in the foreground to the right is Northumbrian Waters Pumping Station for, for, for sewage and, and other outflows. So um, the mud in here is pretty nutrient rich and supports the large numbers of birds. It wasn't in the past. I mean, in, in, pollutant levels would have been an awful lot higher on the trees in the past. Um, they are now a lot better. And Dab home goat at low tide is probably supporting 400 teal, 100 oyster catcher, and, and double figures of things like grey heron. So a significant proportions of cheese mouths um, certain species of tea smelts birds. Um, and this is, a, this is a wetland at called Greenabella Marsh and the factory you can see in the background is Venator, formerly Huntsman, uh, and they make the, the white pigments for, for white goods. Um, photograph is taken from the seawall and behind you in this picture will be seal sands. And on this side here you've got uh, 20 hectare, 20 hectares, which Venator basically classes their nature reserve, and about 10 hectares of that is reed bed. So before RSP, RSPB sold to them, this was the biggest reed bed on Teesside, and it's had breeding marsh harry on there, for example. <clears throat> and this is what it would have looked like before Venator got there. This looks like it's just this is taken just as it was being constructed. And you can see the uh, seawall in, in the mid distance and seal sands behind that. And basically it was farmland. And uh, if you look in the, the very foreground of the picture on the other side of the Tees Road, see what looks like a, a hay crop being taken there. And this is what that field looks like now. This is uh, Canoga Felix tank farm. And what they farm is petroleum. And at one point possibly still is, uh, the second largest uh, petroleum storage uh, depot, if you like, uh, in Europe. And what they have is each of these massive tanks is surrounded by huge buttons covering very large areas that separate them from each other and, and obviously contain any kind of spills. And they have more buttons than they have tanks. And this is one that has flooded and uh, contains you know, great crested newts, probably in the three figures. So that's an accidental wetland, but, but quite an effective one. This is one that was built on purpose, and this is another company, Sabic, which have, um, have created habitats on their land. And this is, uh, I think, it's a slightly slay line lagoon, but, but the main purpose of this is the island in the middle, which was, was put there and covered in shingle for the nesting common tern. And as other sets have recolonized um, Teesside, uh, this is where they've actually gone in the first instance rather than to RSPB salt on. So they've, uh, they've, they've obviously liked this, this particular habitat, possibly due to the, the saline habitats around it. And we have inland salt marsh on Teesside as well. Uh, again, created by industry, but this time accidentally. So this is the same company. And this is a, a wellhead. Um, and underneath here are some vast cavities a long way down where Brian would have been excavated in, in the past and are still used for storing chemicals and for storing brine. And occasionally the brine escapes, um, a little bits of it, and seeps in the ground, making it saline, and you end up with this, which is an inland salt marsh, not connected to the sea at all, but, but still good for waders and still good for salt marsh plants. Uh, again, a uh, slightly more artificial looking lake. Uh, this is on the British Steel site. Um, and this is right in the middle of the, of the steelworks factory itself, surrounded by big sheds like this and lay down areas and, and, and other, what would have been operational areas in the past. And, and a lovely little haven right in the middle of it. And on a smaller scale, this one of the other companies has, has just created a a small wetland, wetland area within their land as well. And, and these are dotted around by the number of the companies. And this plant here, the, the flowering plant in this one, is water hyacinth. And this only grew in one place in the whole of the Tees Valley. 
And it was introduced to a newly created pond on, on one of the uh, industrial sites. And it likes it so much there that it actually has to be pulled out as a weed on an annual basis. It's doing so well there. Why it's doing what, that so well there when it doesn't seem to be doing very well anywhere else, I have no idea, but, but doing well it certainly is. And the other habitat we got on Teesside are the brownfield sites that you would probably expect. And we're back at the tank farm and we're back in another disused bun, but this one a dry one. And these are fragrant orchids by the hundred. And it's absolutely so slightly surreal to have this money like scene in the foreground and then industry in the background uh, looking like that. This is probably a more typical view of, of brownfield habitats. And you get a feel in this one of um, what sort of habitat it is. Now, this isn't looking at its best by any means, but what you can see with this is you've got an open habitat and it's built largely on blast furnace slag. The, the steelworks producing a lot of this as a byproduct, but it's effectively as waste. And that has been used to, um, well, to fill in the intertidal areas for one thing. Uh, and just as a dressing, as to create hard standing for, for lay down areas, for operational areas. Um, and this contains a high proportion of calcium silicate, which makes it calcareous, very low nutrients, so the, so, uh, and, and it's very dry as well. So the grass is struggling to get, get a hold on there, and that leaves plenty of spaces for the other plants that can survive a bit better. Um, just in the background there, you can see that very silvery bush there, that is sea buckthorn. And, that is, uh, that is an invasive species on Teesside. Um, it can fix nitrogen in its roots, so it can cope with the fact that these areas are nutrient poor. And one of the issues that we do have is that um, sea buckthorn is invading and, and, and swamping some of these areas. So that is a bit of an ongoing battle. And the slag can occasionally give the impression of being a sort of geological formation, but this isn't caused by any tectonic plates buckling and folding the land. This is just a great big bale of slag that's been left and hasn't weathered very much at all, and things are struggling to get a hold on it. But it looks really quite spectacular. And at the right season and at the right stage of succession, Brownfield habitats can be really quite spectacular, and this is uh, this is a Johnson Matthews Phoenix site, and this is this is a little bit that they've set aside as a nature reserve, and this is covered in birds with trefoil and hawk's beard and a number of other plants, and is still still fairly open. Uh, some scrub in the background, and probably in five years' time, that will need a little bit of management to keep it open, but when it's when it's right, it's good. Um, and a lot of the sites we deal with, they, they, that's the way they've been constructed. They're the large areas where blast furnace slag has been put down. Um, this is back at Venator, um, as you recall, is, is largely a wetland site, but they thought they'd have a little bit of brownfield as well. So they've actually created this. They've actually imported some, paid for it, and created um, a small brownfield area based on iron slag and that that support that um doesn't this doesn't work as effectively as having several hectares covered in blast furnace slag but it still works and still after 10 years or more it's still supporting typical brownfield species and on a slightly larger scale this is Mitsubishi chemicals at Billingham and the area in the background with the uh, with the vehicles on it used to be a factory uh, that was knocked down and the ground leveled and that left them with an awful lot of um, um, material that, that they would need to get rid of and rather than that go for landfill what we advised them they actually made a feature out of it so in the foreground here they've, they've actually used that material and put the subsoil on the top to create a large mound um, which is fairly nutrient poor at least on the surface and this was sown with a wildflower mix and probably no more than three years after the last photograph, this is what you're looking at. And while it is a, a standard you know, packet wildflower mix with, with your ladies bed straw and, and your nap weeds and, and your yarrows, nevertheless, it is floristically very, you know, very rich. Uh, these very flowers are very abundant and consequently pollinating insects are, 
are very abundant there as well. Uh, and just to go through a, a few of the species that, that we get on Teesside, um, we don't have a lot of species of orchid, but we do have a lot of orchids. So going sort of, uh, left to right, you've got fragrant orchid, common spotted, bee orchid at the back, what's supposed to be in the northern marsh orchid, but actually looks like it's a hybrid in this particular picture. And then pyramidal orchid on the far right, which is what I tend to think of as the, the typical brownfield orchid. But other than bee orchid, all of these species will be found somewhere on Teesside in their hundreds. And bee orchid itself, although it's found abundantly, is, is still, still very widespread. Uh, and the flora is changing all the time as, as um, you know, new species are blown in on the wind or brought in with material or frankly, in some cases, fly tipped. Um, not sure how this one got here, but it didn't arrive on Teesside till 2007. This is narrow-leaved ragwort, which is a South African plant. And to say that it was first found in 2007, it is now the most commonly seen plant on the bearer areas. So whether it's ousted Oxford ragwort, I don't know, but on the kind of areas where you'd expect to see Oxford ragwort, you're now seeing almost exclusively this. And it will thrive on areas such as this, where you've just got the slightest bit of crack in an other, otherwise hard standing, and, and probably its only competition is in these areas is, is things like stone crops. Um, but within the flora, there are three species probably that typify Teesside. Now, these are species that, that do well on these sort of open, calcareous, dry, uh, glass furnace lag uh, conditions because they are, they, they are deep rooted. And one of them is, is kidney vetch, which is in the foreground in this picture. Um, another one is bird's foot trefoil. And the third one is hare's foot clover. And in some places, they just dominate, and that's pretty much or you can see over fairly large swathes. And they come with their, um, with their attendant species. And if you know your butterflies well, uh, you'll realize that this is a small blue, which generally isn't supposed to occur in the Northeast. Um, I believe there are some old records from around Berwick and there are Victorian records from South Gare, but otherwise it is a species that, that isn't found in the Northeast. Um, these, these are some butterflies uh, that were, were from Whitehaven and they were about to meet some bulldozers on a, a building site and no doubt come off worse. So working with butterfly conservation, um, the, some of the butterflies were captured and they were translocated and introduced or reintroduced, if you like, on the tea side, onto one of the uh, industrial sites, which has a lot of kidney vetch. Now, unfortunately, following the, uh, the translocation, uh, it rained really heavily for quite a long period and we thought we'd probably lost them. Uh, this was in 2019, but last year there were still some small blue there. So obviously some of them survived and did manage to breed. And we'll be going back this year to see, see how well they're doing, whether the population perhaps needs reinforcing, but hopefully, um, there will be a population established on Teesside. And once established, there are lots of places with kidney veg. So there's lots of really good habitat for small blue on Teesside if it can manage to get established. Another species that the, probably the typical species, I would say, of brownfield Teesside is this, the dingy skipper, which is not looking too dingy in this particular picture, actually. Um, and its larval food plant is birds with trefoil and it needs that in combination with fairly open areas and they are just there in abundance on Teesside. And there are a number of sites with, with these in double figures. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the local wildlife site criteria is a population of dingy skipper. And that will be, you know, if, if a site has at least 10 dingy skipper, it qualifies as a local wildlife site and a lot of industrial sites will have that many. We estimate there are probably something in the region of about 300 dingy skipper spread across Teesside. So quite possibly a national stronghold, not just a regional stronghold. 
And another interesting species for Teesside is the brown argus. This is a species that's been moving north uh, in recent years and is found just south of the Tees. And one of the sites in Billingham, uh, well, the site we, we saw earlier at Johnston Mathy with all that nice birds with Trefoil and Hawksbeard, um, that has, I don't know if it's still the case, but until recently that was the, the only site in the northeast with an established breeding colony of brown argus. And some of the more specialised habitats have their specialised species. So we're back on the inland salt marsh here, and these are three species of, of moth, uh, which, which live on salt marsh plants. And consequently, you know, these industrial sites are you know, a regional stronghold for these species because salt marshes is a very ha rare habitat in the northeast. Perhaps a little less specialised, but um, there are certain species that um, that just live on um, Phragmites, and we have an awful lot of Phragmites right on Teesside. Uh, these are four species of Wayne Scott, uh, which are all managing to look very much like each other. I'll just leave that slide up there a little longer for the moth specialists among you just to appreciate. Um, and we also have shore wayne scot on, on the sand dunes on Teesside, which is again um, quite a locally rare species. So moving on to birds, uh, apologies for the quality of the photograph, I'm guessing that the boat was moving quite a bit when this was taken. But these are the jetties where the oil tanks come in and along the jetties is a colony of kittiwakes. It's very little known because there is nowhere that you can actually see these from other than going out on a boat to have a look at them and once a year Inca goes out on a boat to count them and numbers generally speaking were kind of 100 200 pairs but um the last time we counted them we it's getting up to almost 400 pairs now and in the last couple of years there have been a few pairs of breeding shag which is which is the first for Cleveland as well first for Teesside. And these are the avocets, uh, which, and this is the island that, that uh, we saw earlier on that, that Sabic created. Um, these are a pair of avocets that have moved on to it. And avocets are, are quite well established now. There's probably, probably a couple of dozen pairs across Teesside. Another habitat that I didn't mention because there's not a lot to say about it is the rank grassland. There is a, a fair amount of rank species poor grassland, but it's not poor in small mammals. There are lots and lots of field voles everywhere, and consequently, we do quite well for barn owls as well, several pairs of barn owls. Uh, this again is taken on, on Green and Bella Marsh on, on Benator's nature reserve where they've erected some barn owl boxes, and there'll be a, a pair in there every year. Um, obviously this is the common toad um, and common toads do really well on, on Teesside. Um, we don't do that great for amphibians generally speaking and I suspect the reason is that most of the water bodies are, are slightly brackish, not, not to a great extent but probably a couple of parts per thousand um, and, and I'm guessing that frogs and, and newts tend not to do so well on that but that toads don't seem to mind. Um, and for example, on Seaton Common one year, we, we went and did a count and we counted over three and a half thousand toads. And at that point, it was mostly male toads, the females were just starting to arrive. So, you know, astonishing number of toads in places. Sometimes the water can be, the water can be actually black with a number of toad pools in them. But much rarer is the common lizard. and there have been a few reports on the north side of the Tees on industrial areas, but I am wondering, there have been so few and far between, and these areas have been watched by bird watchers for such a long time that I'm, I'm wondering if there might be introductions. But certainly there is a population south of, of the Tees, all the way from South Gear down to Red Kerr along across the strip there, occasionally scuttling under the fence and onto the former steelworks site as well. So this is, this is the common lizard. 
And another feature of the industrial site, sites is that they are pretty much high security. And consequently, you're not getting anybody with a lurcher wandering across these sites. And therefore, you're getting large numbers of little animals that might otherwise be put off by disturbance, uh, including deer. Uh, raw deer seem to go around in groups on Teesside, and the most that's been counted in together is 13, which I don't know if that's a record for raw deer, but usually, you, you know, twos or threes is about what you would see. Uh, and we, get, we occasionally get small herds of them. Uh, and interestingly, on going back to the reed beds at Venator, there is a group of deer that live on there year round, almost like Chinese water deer, and they just live in and among the reeds. And another species that does really well because of that is the brown hare. It can be seen across most of the, the industrial sites. Um, we've got areas of long grass and bits of scrub to hide in and areas of mown grass where I suspect the grass tastes a bit tastier for them to feed on. The numbers would probably be higher still were it not for the enormous fox population that, that we get on Teesside, which is probably bolstered by um, bits of pork pie and sandwich from most of the security cabins as, as they do the rounds on the night. Um, may, maybe that's a useful balance, probably would be, would be falling over brown hairs if it wasn't for them. And, and there's you know, not a wide variety of mammals because we haven't got a, a wide variety of habitats, um, but there are others. And uh, on one particular site, I was I was asked to go and have a look at it and, and see whether or not they'd got badges. And I, I thought that unlikely and have to have a good old route around where I couldn't find any scrapes or sniffle holes or tracks. Browns as hard as rock. I turned to them and said, no, not a chance of badger here. This is a trail camera picture of the same site. And this is a badger's bum disappearing under the underpass. So it just shows that after 30 years of fairly intensively looking at the nature on Teesside, there's still quite a lot for us to learn. And this has just been a, a quick tour of Teesside and uh, there's, there's quite a lot more you know, within the book if you want to explore it further. So if anybody would like a copy of the book, it is um, available by mail order from our, our email address and it's £12.50 including 